Well, I'm going to talk about numinous experience today and it's, um, why it's thought to have a healing potential. The reason I became interested in this um, partly has to do with a vision that I had many years ago. I, I didn't know quite what to do with this experience. And then I had a, 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 a dream and I realized that the, the, the two experiences, the dream and the vision, both have the same theme, of course, the theme of being seen from above or from another dimension, as it were, from somewhere else. So what I'd like to do today is talk about this kind of experiences uh, and show how they can occur in various channels, in dreams and in visionary experiences, in relationships in the natural world through the body, uh, and in some other ways. The Jungian model says that, th that these kind of experiences that I've described, what Otto, Rudolf Otto, a famous Lutheran theologian, in, in, in 1917 described as numinous experiences. Okay, and numinous comes, as you heard this morning, from the Latin verb nuere, which means to nod or to beckon. So the sense of this is of divine approval. But what's very, very important is that numinous experiences occur to ordinary people all the time. They are not confined to the saints and mystics and the founders of the tradition. What, well, one always has to ask, is this addressing some problem or issue or developmental difficulty of the subject? Because I believe that numinous experiences are always tailored to the individual psychology of the subject. They're not random. Um, you get the numinous experience that you need, in other words. One of the critiques of Otto is that he used fancy Latin phrases. And the phrase that he used for this was the mysterium tremendum et fascinant. It just means a mystery which is tremendous and fascinating. And um, he made the point that they, these are awe-inspiring, they're sometimes dreadful, uh, sometimes blissful or joyful, sometimes horrific, but always have that sense of something addressing us from somewhere else. He, he talked about it as otherness. There's a, there are some problems with that notion of otherness since, uh, as we'll see, one of, the th one of the moves that Jung makes is to locate the sacred and the numinous deeply within our own subjectivity. It's not quite as other as some of the traditional Judeo-Christian theologians would like. They would like it to be very transcendent. In Jungian psychology, it's much more in our own subjectivity. The experiences are so powerful that they are what we call self-authenticating. When you've had one of these kind of experiences, there's no doubt in the subject's mind that you've been in touch with something very special. Um, so you get images which are very numinous, which are not Judeo-Christian. Some of them are like that are overtly pagan. In, in, according to this theory, the reason for that is that uh, you're getting imagery from this mythopoetic level of the psyche, and by virtue of being human, you participate. It doesn't matter what your individual ego. You may have been brought up in a particular religious tradition, as we all were, but by virtue of being human, you you participate in this larger consciousness. So, image. So the psyche will produce an image from any pantheon, any religious tradition, which is specifically relevant to you. It doesn't matter. Uh, your, your ego identity, where you think you grew up and so on, is really relatively super, superficial because our, our real identity is extremely deep and mysterious. We are not who we think we are. And Jung said that his, as it were, his theory of healing was that what really heals in psychotherapy is contact with the numinosum. And he said that frees you from the curse of pathology. It's not simply pathology once you've had that level of contact. So the voice and voices in dreams and visions are always extremely important. They're usually taken to be the voice of the self or the voice of God, if you like. The, the difference between this kind of approach and traditional approaches is you're not really asked to believe anything. Um, belief may crumble in the face of great suffering and difficulty, but, but Jung was very keen on this distinction between direct experience and belief just for this reason, because once you've had this kind of experience, in a, in a sense, you don't need belief or faith because you have knowledge. That was one of the major points, and that was based on his father's experience. So in this approach to spirituality, direct experience is far more important than correct teaching or correct belief or something like that. <laughs> 